world and welcome to the Pop Discourses, where we explore popular notions in the long conversation. I'm your host, Humboldt Ben. special episode today, a introductory interview with poet, novelist, editor, and translator Larissa Schmalo, uh, a resident of New York City and someone that has devoted a lot of attention to words and writing, and fits in really well here um, on the pop discourses. So, without much further ado, let's listen to our talk with Larissa Schmalo. Welcome, Larissa Schmilo. Did I say that right? You did. You said it perfectly. And uh, I have that. I have that diphthong that throws people off. It should people come in with Schmilo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I was lucky. Uh, uh, welcome to the Pop Discourses. Uh, I've got. Uh, you labeled as a poet, novelist, editor, and translator. I know there are other features to your career, critic, for instance. And i um, really glad to have you here for some conversation. That sounds wonderful. Let's converse. Well, very good. I know I had... Posed uh, something of a glib um, introductory uh, question for you. I don't know whether that will help or not. Uh, we certainly want folks to have a sense of who you are. Um, I know you as someone that's been intensely involved in language and literature. And that's why I'm so glad uh, to have you here. Well, thank you. You know, and, and uh, I think I think intensely involved is 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 accurate. You know, I I, I it is what gives my life meaning, literature, and joy. I, I that's 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 what gives my life meaning and joy. Right. Um, just because there's something of a metaphysical bent to this podcast, and we do also try to uh, connect it to the current or the popular, I had formulated, uh, I'm just trying it out on you, if you don't mind, this question of, do you remember the first time you encountered abstract thought somehow somehow i think marx is is it was was the first time you know and and the 
theory of surplus value, which you see, the thing is, is that I'm a very concrete person. You know, like I read Max Weber's The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and um, I'm kind of like the Catholic that only does enough to get by, unlike the Protestant. <laughs> I don't know, you know, it's, I'm very concrete. I, I, I try to make an example of every philosophical um, every philosophical term that I encounter. And, um, you know, I, but I think I, I would have to say it was probably encountering Karl Marx where I first, where I first um, had a real, um, but he's very concrete, you know, who <laughs> Marx is. So I, I. Um, we can say that uh, Hegel's dialectic was perhaps a little more abstract. But we don't have to. We don't have to dwell here. Uh, no, that, good, very interesting answer. Um, I know that I'm particularly familiar with a project that you've been involved in for quite some time. Some time it appears. And that's the uh, translation of Victory Over the Sun. And uh, I, yeah. You know, I just presented on the topic of Victory Over the Sun at the Association of Writers and Writers Programs. Um, they did a virtual um, a virtual set of panels this year, and I spoke about Victory, and um, I have a question about it. I mean, I'm grateful to be the first English language translator you know, of of the um, piece, which has become lionized and um, important. So, I'm, you know, I'm grateful for that. But all this talk of war and masculinity, hyper-masculinity, I'm wondering why, why victory is privileged above the other, um, uh, above the other works of futurism. As I say, it is, a bit misogynist, you know, the the um Kruchonik thinks of women as soft and um, he, he 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 says symbolist poetry, for example, is like a woman. It's soft and tender and pleasant and he eschews all of that. He eschews all of that. But um you know his his drive towards masculinity is so intense that that he um he masculinizes certain Russian words which are of the feminine gender. Uh, we don't have gender in English, so this is almost untranslatable. You know, in reading the intro introduction, Eugene Ashestevsky sets out the history, of course, that it was produced in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, what's now St. Petersburg in 1913. And um, there was a door. People would pay nine rubles uh, to get in. But getting that initial question of the relationship of the abstract to the concrete, he does such a wonderful job setting out the abstractions that the futurist puts or the zaum. Zaum. Right? Zaum or transrational, transrational. Um, Zaum in Russian. These are these are not fancy words like um, transrational. Um is wit, intelligence, um, and za means beyond. So well, zaum is beyond intelligence. We we usually call it transrational writing. Oh, so he sets out the manifestos that were drawing the authors of the opera into congregation with the abstract in a really thorough way, and then you get into the translation, and that setup certainly uh, illuminates some of the concrete poetics of the piece. The, 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 the whole point of the work is... Uh, Razlom or breaking, um, disruption, this 
you know, semantics are disrupted. Normal expected forms of drama and opera are disrupted. Um, the, 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 the pieces, um, you know, like um, a, a poem could be here, uh, bold, could be just neologisms and, um, and consonant clusters. So it's still probably the most radical thing out there. Well, all by way of introduction, in particular, I know that your uh, current focus, uh, I mean, I do see that a new collection of poems will be released by uh, Dora Laura. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's um, about the collectivization of... Um of of the Ukraine, you know, during the 1930s, the um, collectivization and the um, more the death of starvation, and also during the Holocaust, the role of Ukraine and Ukrainians through the lens of my family. Sounds really interesting. And uh, I know that also you've put together a, a workshop series uh, entitled Writing Resilience, where uh, you're putting yourself in a position to encourage the people in their writing given various personal circumstances. And we'll be talking about uh, that some more uh, as we wrap up. I think we also suggested that maybe we discuss some of your influences uh, in writing. Uh, in particular, I believe you had mentioned James Joyce, um, the Irish novelist, if we can call him that. I, you know, I, I read Ulysses and uh, I, I felt liberated. I felt, um, I felt allowed to do the unusual and the strange and to, you know, uh, pack a book full, of, as, as Joyce said, I have put so much into this for the professors, they'll be busy for years, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, I, I actually spent a summer um, writing erasure poems of the 18 episodes. Um, I can read you one of the Lotus Eaters if you'd like to hear it. Now, what was that word? I don't know that I'm familiar with it. Erasure? An erasure poem is just what it sounds like. You erase. Um, words from a piece to create a new piece, and um, I have one here of um, of the um, lotus eaters. I erased all the words, and I kept a series of sentences um, in in um, the order in which I saw them. And um, I so I'm going to read you um, this erasure of the lotus eaters. That'd be awesome. Okay, good. Um, by lorries along Sir John Rogerson's quay, past Nichols the Undertaker's, eleven, dare say, sent his right hand with slow grace over his hair. Where was the chap I saw in that picture somewhere? Ah, in the Dead Sea, floating on his back. It's a law like that, curriculum, crack. It's the force of gravity of the earth is the weight. Per second, per second, post office, too late. Eleven, is it? I only heard it last night. What's wrong with him? Dead, and he filled up all right. Chloroform, laudanum, sleeping draughts, phlegm. Better leave him the paper and get shut of him. And that's what I erased and kept from the um, from that particular episode, The Lotus Eaters. Such nice uh, rhythm and, and rhyme. You know, of course, Joyce started his writing career with with just a mastery of this conventional, dare I say, romantic narrative with the short story like The Dubliners and its doublets and uh, the epiphany that it describes. And then by the time we get to his final work, Finnegan's Wake, we're dealing <laughs> with something that uh, appears to be very akin to what the futurist and uh, Zaum was about. 
you have any reflection on that movement? I think that's an. Uh, I think you you have come up with a a wonderful conjunction of of, of Zaum and um, and Joyce. You know that's right. The, um, the, the that last work is um, transrational, if you will. You know. So that I I I I've never heard that before, and I think that's apt. Well, of course, it was a continental movement, from what I can tell, just kind of bringing myself up to speed, and that for futurist in Italy, of course, uh, Finnegan's Wake followed uh, Victory Over the Sun by uh, it was later, a decade or so. Later in its in its beginning, and it wasn't published until 1939, I believe. And of course, Victory Over the Sun was written or produced in 1913. That's right. That's um, but the influence of of Dada 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 kind of followed Futurism too. Dada Dada is about a year behind. Um, the Russian futurists and the Italian futurists, they aligned themselves with fascism as the Russian the Russian futurists aligned themselves with at least Mayakovsky did until he was destroyed by um by communism. Um you know, they they aligned themselves with these mass movements. It's really interesting. Uh of course there are other notable theatrical um, events in Russia in the decline of the monarchy. Uh, Gurdjieff was producing The Morning of the Magicians in Moscow around that time. Uh, the social inequities were great, I think, leading up to the revolution. There was a time where sailors left their post on Russian naval vessels and um, the lords, the feudal lords, or the royalist lords, or, uh, there was a kind of decadence I read uh, of a, a performance, I suppose. A hundred decadent uh, peasants involved in a erotic, lyrical, a pastoral performance for the benefit of some of these nobles. So there was a lot of performance happening yeah, in it was it, in, in in yes in the eighteen eighties the um the laws regarding theater were relaxed um and um and in the eighteen eighties began this incredible variegated enormous rush to theater everywhere. Victory was only one of, I mean, victory, nine rubles. That was a fortune, you know. <laughs> um, but um, the theater, you know, symbolist and um, natural realist theater, Chekhov, then, um, anyway, the, the, the theater was enormously rich and variegated at that, at, during that time, pre revolutionary. I wonder what was driving that from a social perspective. Well, as I say, um, the laws surrounding theaters and what could be staged and what could be organized had changed dramatically in the 1880s. Um, and uh, there was a relaxation of censorship as well. Interesting. Well, tie that back in to your work, please. To my work now, I am. Um, we were talking about Joyce, and I'm sorry I went off on that the tangent uh, with the Zaum, but it, it just seemed natural. You know, I I have a book of. I'm an experimentalist. And I'm also a neo formalist. You know, I do I do rhyming poetry and metrical poetry because I feel no one else is doing it. You know, free free verse. Free verse is hegemonic right now in poetry, and so I'm a bit of a contrarian. I I I I, I go to form sometimes, but I would say my my first full length 
um, my first full-length um, book of poetry is variegated. It is both um, formal and experimental. My second full-length is special characters, and that is highly experimental. And Medusa's Country is neo-formalist, my third full-length collection. So how does the influence of James Joyce appear in those expressions? Um, it appears it appears in um, my not having a single um, a, a single style. I, I I move through many different styles. I mean, you know, Joyce uses everything: stream of consciousness, a flash, if you will, if if you don't mind the um, use of that term, historically out of sync, but. Um, um, and you know the um, dialogue and the rest. I guess the the thing about Joyce, what he did was he absolutely liberated me to write any way I like. And I will write a a very strict formal piece one time, and then an experimental piece um, the next day. So, so one critic said this this woman writes whatever she likes to write. <laughs> More power to you. Well, so you want to talk about your workshop series some. I definitely would like to tell you about that. Writing Resilience is a workshop for people who have been affected by trauma, addiction, or mental illness. Depression counts, childhood abuse and neglect counts, and we had a very successful workshop in January. Um, many pieces were generated by the um, the uh, participants, and um, I'm doing it again in April. The class is full up now, but I'll be doing it again in I think June as well. The the um, it's it's. It's meant to empower us, you know, sort of like the Me Too stories of the Me Too movement or slave narratives or the way in which people tell their stories in 12-step groups. It's empowering and it can increase coping and resilience. And that's the whole thrust of, of, of the workshops, you know. So as I say, April is full up, but I'll be doing it again in June. And um, I also hope to be doing it for special audiences and to um, assist therapists in, in, in using writing to help their clients. Uh, that's great. That sounds great. Um, it seems to me all the, the writing that's compelling has to light on uh, situations and dimensions and facts and relationships and realities, and to the degree that that's forward-moving, broad in scope, uh, drawing out detail and facts and the concrete, uh, that it's really beneficial in, in terms of a kind of mind expansion and an organizing into kind of meta metaphysical reflections that we might be prone to as we get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but hopefully it creates a shift in the writer's mind, uh, you know, that uh, um, I think the, the fact of owning your story, owning your dysfunction, is an important step towards being liberated from dysfunction. You know, accepting as the first step of... Um, the twelve step programs admitting you're powerless over it and that your life has become unmanageable uh, interesting well there's more information about Larissa at her website, and I'll post that link with this recording and I know you have a very um, detailed uh, Wikipedia entry uh, that sets forth your your work and your place um, in in the stream of um, 
of influences that literature can tend to be. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yes, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to talk about myself and to, you know, share um, a poem. You know, poets need listeners like alcoholics need vodka, Pushkin said. So we are always grateful for an audience that will listen to us and, and hear us. So thank you very much for having me here. Well, thank you uh, so much for uh, appearing on the pop discourses and engaging in this uh, introductory uh, discourse. And uh, hopefully there'll be an opportunity to have you back and talk more detail about some of these topics we've touched on. Sounds wonderful, Jeff. Very good. Larissa, thank you so much. And I'll look to get you a link so you can hear what we've done. That's wonderful. All right. Venceremos. <laughs> yeah. well, I had something. My Russian's a little bit... Uh, Rusty. Das was Daniels. Das vidanya, daragoy Jeff. Das vidanya. Das korova. Ah. Horror show. Horror show. Ochin horror show.